In 2017, on the eve of the Crash Bandicoot Ensign trilogy, I outlined my wants for a Crash Bandicoot sequel in a video called Why Crash Works. Analyzing the successes of the three original games, I drew up some potential ideas for where things could go next. Should the remastered trilogy be successful enough to warrant a new game in the series? The year is now 2021, and in that time we have received not one, but two new Crash Bandicoot games. Three if we count a remaster of Crash Team Racing. I would say that the future seems bright for the Orange Marsupial, although Activision's corporate restructuring have lightly derailed those plans. For now, we can evaluate these two in comparison to the original, to answer the question of whether Crash still works. Crash Bandicoot 4 is about time, and Crash Bandicoot on the run stand on opposite ends of production values. The former is a console and PC game structured in a similar manner to the original trilogy, but with all new graphical fidelity. Crash on the Run is a mobile game built on the foundations of the incredibly popular Subway Surface template. One is designed to sit in between everyday phone use, whilst the other is for dedicated game time. So how do they adapt the Crash Bandicoot format? And to what success? Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is the retcon follow-up to Crash Bandicoot 3, Warped. Wiping the slate of future sequels, we instead pick up following the trilogy some years later, where Crash is once again asked to stop Neo Cortex. This time he's joined by his sister Coco, who can be swapped in as a secondary protagonist, as was the case in the remaster. Taking cues from Crash 3, our adventure goes through a number of new biomes beyond time and space from jungles to junkyards to even a New Orleans inspired parade in one of the game's most impressive moments. For your entry price, Crash 4 spans around 40 plus levels, each an obstacle course littered with bad guys, pitfalls and plenty of crates to smash through. Very much standard Crash Bandicoot fare. You're still expected to reach an end goal, although grabbing a crystal is no longer necessary. There's still plenty of additional spokes you can explore and gemstones are still there for those looking for an additional challenge although more on those later. However, evolving on the trilogy, these level layouts are less tightly defined. In fact, they may change in perspective or gameplay at multiple points throughout their runtime, like the best levels of the later trilogy did. As an example, one of the earliest levels starts as a traditional platform challenge, before transitioning to a Boulder Dash style set piece with Crash in a Roll Cage attempting to escape heavy machinery. It feels a little more natural than the straight lines of old Crash, and it's a great fit considering the even bigger push to make this world a living cartoon. Cutscenes are more frequent here, and like the latter end of the trilogy, do a lot to make Crash, Coco and the rest of the cast even more appealing. It's a testament to how incredible animation in games has become in the years since, and the talent at Toys for Bob. Speaking of, there's plenty of new tricks Crash has learned since the original trilogy. For starters, his movement kit has been tweaked to include a double jump. This was always unlockable in the third game, but by having it available right at the get-go here, level design has been tweaked to include it. It's not always necessary, making it a great recovery tool on trickier jumps. Improving jumping still is a bright yellow reticule underneath the bandicoots that makes landing jumps far less of a headache. It's a small quality of life inclusion, but one that's greatly appreciated. Something brand new here is the ability to grind and abseil rails. Not exactly a move that a player can trigger all the time, but rather it's a shift in gameplay that subtly tweaks controls, turning these sections more into the animal levels of the original trilogy, except with a wrinkle of ducking as well as jumping to respond to either an upcoming obstacle or crate. They're a good fit though, and further compound the point that these levels aren't just one thing throughout, as these rail sections are used frequently to shift the tempo. Perhaps the biggest addition however are the masks. In my 2017 analysis, Aku Aku was something only lightly touched upon. It was a treat awaiting players who not only sought him out, but were careful to not get hurt. Collecting free granted Crash a temporary invincibility that allowed for some much needed catharsis. But this invincibility wasn't necessary for completing the game. This is not the case with the new masks of Crash 4, which instead are tied into the core gameplay. The earliest you get, Lanny Lolly, allows Crash to blip in and out temporarily displaced objects. In layman's terms, it's a button to make some platforms and objects tangible, and others not. It's a very cool idea, made more unique through the fact that it's something in the player's control. Platforms that appear and disappear are something that the Super Mario games have done previously, 
either tying it to an incidental move or having it on a sequence set to music. Here however, the player is in charge of when these platforms come in and out. Going back to my previous analysis of the trilogy, it puts momentum control very much in the player's hands, and creates new challenges through coordinating this new move with the rest of Crash's movement kit. All four of the game's masks do this, though fortunately they don't overlap each other's power sets, avoiding things from getting too confusing. Levels are a lot longer and fully featured than the previous trilogy. This isn't me speaking from a place of experience, but even the length of the earliest Crash Bandicoot 4 levels encompassed the length of maybe two levels of the original trilogy. Fitting of its subtitle is about time, as in the time you're made to play it. Fortunately, Crash Bandicoot 4 has made some additional quality of life changes that make this runtime a bit more bearable. Lives are no longer necessary, if you don't want them. Rather, if you choose to play on modern mode, you can start from a checkpoint as many times as you want, and the game instead counts the number of deaths incurred. This is really appreciated, and is a nice fit with the past few years of platform games that have dropped the need for lives entirely, instead looking at other means to encourage players to play well. This encouragement is especially true if you're going for the gems. They're a little less important for unlocking new levels in Crash 4, but they do have a nice bonus attached, unlocking new costumes for Crash and Coco. Again, the game is very much aware of how appealing Crash and Coco Bandicoot are as characters, and so a means to dress them up is a great feature for a younger audience who are used to cosmetics in games like Fortnite and Super Mario Odyssey. Best of all, nearly all of them are tied to collecting gems, rather than being placed behind microtransactions. It is nice that costumes aren't totally necessary however, because the conditions for unlocking them are quite high. Like before, there's a gemstone for destroying all craze, something which is far more difficult in this game due to the hundreds per level, and how well hidden they are in more complex level design. There's also one for dying below a certain threshold, for example only three times. You also get free gemstones for how many Wumpa fruit you collect, which gives these fruits value in a game where lives are no longer necessary. Finally, there's a secret one hiding in every level, requiring detective work and very tricky platforming. And collecting all six in a level nets you a new costume. Fortunately, you're not expected to do all these things at once, and once you've completed a level the first time, you unlock time trials, which again return from the remastered trilogy. Then, included on top of all these levels are inverted versions that add a new wrinkle of challenge, six more gems to collect, and a cool visual gimmick. There's also bonus flashback levels that focus on tight 2D platforming. These are unlocked by collecting videotapes later in levels if you can avoid dying. Then there's secondary levels starring new characters outside of Crash and Coco to play as. Fortunately, they don't require an enormous upheaval of controls, and stick around long enough that you do get used to their quirks. Crash Bandicoot 4 is a rather luxurious package for his return to the home market. The developers behind the game didn't need to reinvent the wheel, however there is innovation here, and quality of life inclusions that make it feel thoroughly modern. Tastes have changed in the years since, with platform enthusiasts far more aligned to the open world Mario style of games, however it's very much down to how much content those titles have, and Crash 4 certainly has a lot of content to it. It is sometimes to a detriment, as these levels aren't quite as snappy as the older games, and collecting gemstones a far greater challenge. However, they are a better fit for a game designed primarily for focused television play, where you're going to take an hour or two to play for a few levels, either moving the story forward or going back to get some elusive gems or videotapes. Why the decision was made to have that set amount of longer levels rather than more shorter levels is questionable, however. Though by how frequent the aesthetics and styles change between levels, it may have been a case of limiting repetition in art assets. It may have also been done to make it feel more like a grander adventure. Certainly however, Crash Bandicoot 4 is about time proves that Crash does still work. By calling itself Crash 4, it is reverent to that trilogy, and despite new masks and a new dimension hopping storyline, it retains what made the original games a mainstay of the PlayStation. Toys for Bob have proven themselves as adept at creating linear obstacle courses with plenty of exciting set piece moments as Naughty Dog was back in the 90s. Even better, they're not completely beholden to that framework. Throughout Crash 4, levels keep up in the ante of what's possible, mixing together previously introduced mechanics to create big challenges. Like the best Mario levels, an idea will be introduced, built up and then twisted, before your challenge to demonstrate everything you know about it by the level's end. 
Importantly, by fleshing out the character Crash Bandicoot, it separates him further from Super Mario and Sonic the Hedgehog. Both franchises have been able to hone in on cartoonier aspects in recent years, but none to the extent that Toys for Bob have for Crash, over-delivering on the Looney Tunes-inspired animation of the original trilogy. Overall, it does feel like the start of something great for Crash Bandicoot. However, considering recent news, it may end up just being a celebration of what made the character an icon. Crash Bandicoot On The Run is a 2021 game developed and published by King, the mobile giant part owned by Activision, and the people behind the Candy Crush saga, the nearly decade-old match-free phenomenon. Considering the nearly 20 million times Crash has been downloaded since its release in March, they certainly haven't lost touch with knowing the market, and capitalising on a known quantity. Crash On The Run isn't structured like a traditional Crash Bandicoot game, at least on a larger scale. Instead of a map of levels where completion is your main motivator, it's instead a series of boss fights that are introduced by short, auto-running platform sections. Although platforms shift and enemies change, this is the structure of every single level in Crash on the Run. No new masks, no boulder chases, or even vehicle sections. You can play as his sister Coco, however, and there are different costumes that can be unlocked. This lack of variety is a shame, because as stated in my retrospect of the original trilogy, there's already a lot of Crash Bandicoot's design that fits very well within the template of an infinite runner. All your moves are designed for keeping momentum, and challenges are designed so that you don't come to a complete stop to solve them. King didn't need to do a lot of work to make Crash Bandicoot work in this format. And they didn't. Because Crash on the Run owes much of its design to the Ur example of the genre. Subway Surfers. The Subway Surfers template has been a mainstay of phone games for several years now. Cannon Bolt popularised the Infinite Runner, Temple Run popularised it in 3D, but Subway Surfers has become the most popular variant of the type. A 3D Infinite Runner where the path ahead is split into three individual lanes, each littered with obstacles and alternate levels of elevation. It's a fun take on the usual fare, because using your thumb to flick between lanes as you flick up and down to hop and slide respectively is fun, and a good fit for a big, vertically aligned touchscreen. Crash on the Run does all this, and more because tapping on the screen triggers his iconic spin, allowing you to maintain momentum through crates as you can in all Crash games. Environments have a lot more verticality than the Crash trilogy did too, taking him up onto suspended paths and into underground sections for more crates and fruits. It's the animal sections, but without the animal. Even though Crash Bandicoot is an animal. The thing is, Crash Bandicoot isn't the first franchise to emulate this setup. Katamari Damacy and Sonic the Hedgehog have done so previously to varying levels of success. The former game really appreciates having an open world sandbox to explore, and so isn't that great a fit. Yet, yeah, the latter is an incredibly good fit, at least for the modern interpretation of Boost Focus Sonic. He's the fastest thing alive, so all you need to do is worry about him avoiding obstacles in his way. In fact, I'm a little surprised a fully featured Sonic Infinite Runner hasn't made its way to consoles yet. I apologise if this video gives Sega that idea. But all of this is to say that it makes an already unoriginal take on Crash feel even more so because he isn't the first character to do this setup best. More so, it doesn't fully embrace the infinite running format because these levels are finite. King do at least use this change to have levels build up in challenge as they go along, but not that often. Sections don't really change, and neither do aesthetics. Perhaps the worst thing is that when you do finally get to a boss, you're not even using one of Crash's moves to hit them. Instead, you get a swinging bar that'll decide how well you throw a potion at them. This is how every single boss is defeated. There is also an additional wrinkle that takes a lot of wind out of Crash's sails. The entire game is built around bosses that can only be defeated by potions you brew to destroy them. Potions that need resources you gather in actual infinite running sections. But the thing is, resources can be used up from too many trips, requiring you to wait for them to be restocked. It takes time to gather, and time to brew. And as you can expect, there are means to circumvent waiting around. All these things can be traded for with crystals, which in turn can be bought with your own money. 
If you were to play this at the rate of a normal Crash Bandicoot game, you will be handing over quite a few crystals to do so. And well, I may have stated that Crash 4 was a little stuffed with content, but Crash on the Run prolongs its meagre amount of content into infinitum with a lot of waiting. Which of course can be cut out by coughing up cash. Critique of this kind of mobile game design isn't new, and as stated, King have in the past decade become the well, kings of figuring out how to turn free-to-play games into enormous money makers. But this design does tarnish some of that Crash Bandicoot magic. As an example, for a one-off entry fee, Crash Bandicoot 4 allows me to reset to a checkpoint as many times as I want, allowing me to tackle a particularly tricky platforming section at my own pace. Meanwhile, you can start playing Crash Bandicoot on the run for free, but restarting at a checkpoint will set you back crystals. Ergo, cash. Something that will make you less likely to want to tackle another tricky level again. It's also something that will annoy a younger audience that crashes aimed at even more, when their means to tackle a problem through trial and error is tied to a finite resource. It's cynical to say, but all the waiting does fit this new platform. You're not expected to play Crash on the run for hours at a time. Rather, it's meant to fit within other things you'd use your phone for and is meant to be something that you can pick up at any point for a short amount of time. Potions brew in the background, so you can always come back at a later date to either gather more resources or take out a new boss. It stops things feeling too familiar also. You could feasibly never have to pay a single crystal in Crash on the Run if you're willing to wait. Although I cannot say that for certain. The issue is, Crash Bandicoot 4 has a definite endpoint. It can be the credits once I've beaten all the levels. It could also be when I've collected all the gems, beat all the flashback levels and whatever else is needed to get around 100%. By its design, Crash Bandicoot on the run has no ending, other than when you run out of patience with it. I'm continuing to play it because I do like how levels are bringing in new gimmicks and things to play with, and because I really do like how Crash works as an infinite runner. But this will eventually hit an endpoint. Unlike Crash 4, I imagine much of my satisfaction with Crash on the Run will be long gone when I eventually put it down for good. You might say though that, cynically, this is the nature of the beast. A mobile game can't be ambitious when it's free to play. If Crash Bandicoot on the Run had the confidence that Super Mario Run did to charge £10 for a full-fledged Mario game, or it was released on the Apple Arcade service, perhaps this wouldn't have been an issue. Of course, being developed by King, this was never going to be the case. However, there is still the question to be answered of whether Crash still works as a mobile game. It absolutely does, and if predatory free-to-play mechanics were removed completely, it would be a fantastic example of translating a sit-and-play television experience into a portable one. Of course, the developers could have done a bit more to elevate it out of the Subway Surfers template, but even adding just a bit of Crash's identity does make it feel unique. If the developers had maybe decided to bring in more variety from the console games, stuff like animal sections and the boulder chases, it would be something special, and show that mobile games can do traditional experiences as well as their home counterparts. Comparing the two, it's pretty easy to say that Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is the better example of how to continue Crash Bandicoot's legacy past the trilogy. It's a shinier, friendlier, and funnier version of what we already like. It makes great quality of life improvements, has a lot of great new ideas, and leaves things open for more games in the series. Crash on the Run is very good. It removed the buttons and sticks of a PlayStation controller, changed the screen aspect ratio, and stripped out familiar elements from the Crash series. And it is still, undeniably, a Crash Bandicoot experience, hallmarking everything that made the trilogy work in the early 90s. But it is ultimately marred by its platform. Not by any technical restrictions, but instead the design of its ecosystem. Predatory microtransactions take a lot of fun out of this Crash game. Unfortunately, mobile games are big business, and it's likely that while we won't see Crash Bandicoot 5 for some time due to corporate meddling, we will see more content come to Crash on the run. Mobile games are an ever-evolving space, something in the future I'd love to delve more into on the channel, but Crash Bandicoot doesn't really need to shift with trends. 
He's a character that stood the test of time because even when remade in high definition, that identity and what made him work was still retained. The same goes too for Crash on the Run. If the Apple Arcade and other ventures prove successful, the predatory microtransaction system that mars Crash on the Run may not mar whatever comes next, allowing the next game to be as much of a step up as say Crash Bandicoot 2 was from the original, retaining that great template that works, tweaking it to make things a little more original, and then going off into new creative ventures. But you can't really go wrong with either game. After all, as I said years ago, Crash Bandicoot was more than just a PlayStation mascot, and in the years since, developers have found ways to demonstrate that. If you have the system to do so, Crash 4 would be my recommendation. However, everyone has a mobile phone, so I'd also recommend putting Crash Bandicoot in your pocket. I just wouldn't give him any more of your money, if you can. One topic I've yet to touch on yet is whether the influence of the trilogy has seeped elsewhere. The issue is, as far as my research has gone, is that there's nothing else out there that shows Crash works elsewhere. Although I may have been able to find great examples of games being inspired by the character of Wario, finding indie titles that owe all or most of their identity to Crash is a little trickier. There are linear platformers out there, but most if not all stick to a side-on 2D perspective. Even when Donkey Kong Country returned, it stuck to left to right progression. There's also plenty of animal mascot games, although they mostly stick to the open world template of Mario 64. I don't think it's a case that Crash has no influence, but more so recapturing that pacing and set pieces of his games just hasn't happened yet. Same goes for characters in 3D that quite have his level of expression, which will happen very soon after that technology is available to all developers. Perhaps in the years to come, it could be likely we'll see direct influences from Crash 4 or Crash on the Run instead. But what do you think? Does the future of the Crash Bandicoot series lay elsewhere? Could we see a fifth game in this new series soon? Let me know in the comments below. For now, I've been James, and I'll see you all in the next upload.